Welcome to Centenary United Methodist Church. My name is Robert Gorell and I'm the senior pastor. We welcome you and are glad you're worshiping with us today. As worship begins, let me share some announcements with you. First, youth is tonight at 6 to 7.30 at the building. I will be doing a small mission project and we have game night. Uh, come play, capture the poultry. Then we have a big children's ministry event Wednesday night. I'm so excited about it. You're going to love it. It kicks off uh, the reopening of our children's ministry. That's Wednesday night from 5 to 7 with movie night. Lots of snacks and goodies for the kids and just a great time. So plan on dropping the children off Wednesday night, 5 to 7. And then one of the great traditions here at Centenary is that uh, instead of purchasing flowers for Christmas and Easter that we have for a while and then, then they're just gone, uh, we decided to uh, give a special gift to, to help others. And so we buy these little crosses and hang them on a tree uh, here at church. And uh, you do that in honor or in memory of someone. And then the proceeds from that go to our feeding programs to feed those who are hungry. It's a wonderful ministry, and you can find the form or call the office and, uh, and purchase one of the crosses to be hung on the tree in memory or in honor of someone you love. And I encourage you to do that soon. We want that all uh, finished before Holy Week. And speaking of Holy Week, be sure you have that on your calendar. We will have a Maundy Thursday service with Holy Communion and a Good Friday service in which we remember the day that Christ was crucified. And then, of course, all of the beautiful Easter services. Again, we're so glad you're worshiping with us today. Thank you. Good morning, Refuge. Thank you for joining us in person and online today. We are so blessed to be here as a community, as a church. Let us go to the Lord in prayer. God, prepare our hearts and our minds for this day, for your word, for your praise and your worship, God. Just let that rest in our heart, mold us and change us and use us, God, as you see fit. We love you and we praise you. It's in your son's name that I pray and ask these things. Amen. Let us stand and let us worship.
you in the name of our Savior, Jesus Christ. Good morning and welcome to the Refuge at Centenary United Methodist Church. My name is John Hiller and I want to welcome everyone who is worshiping with us in person and those who are joining us online. Today we're continuing our Lenten sermon series, Follow Me, talking about use it or lose it. When God gives us gifts to use, how can we use them to build God's kingdom? How can we use them to serve others? How can we give abundantly and extravagantly? Today we are here to give our worship to God with everything that we have. Why would you hold anything back today? Why would we hold back any of our praise from God who has given us life, who has given us the opportunity to be here together as we continue with our worship service, will you join me in prayer? Holy God, pour out your Spirit upon us in ways beyond our imagination. Make known to us your grace that you have poured out to us abundantly, that we might give everything we have to you. We pray these things in the name of Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. When darkness tries to roll over my bones When sorrow comes to steal the joy I own When brokenness and pain is all I know I won't be shaken No, I won't be shaken My fear doesn't stand chance when I stand in your love. My fear doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your love. My fear doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your Chance when I stand in your love. 
For over 100 years, Circle of Care has been committed to bringing Christian help, healing, and hope to Oklahoma. Since our beginning as a children's home just north of Oklahoma City in 1917, Circle of Care has grown to reach children, youth, and families in over 70 cities across Oklahoma. Our agency provides services to those in crisis to ensure a safe, healthy, and spiritual future through our four programs. Pearl's Hope serves single mothers in Oklahoma who have lost custody of their children to DHS and are working with the agency to regain custody of their children. Pearl's Hope allows women a safe and encouraging environment to regain custody and address barriers that prevent them from living a safe and healthy life. Circle of Care partners with communities throughout Oklahoma to educate, recruit, and empower families to open their hearts and homes to children in need. Our prayer is that broken families in the foster care system can be reunified during this process. Our Preparation for Adult Living program is designed to cultivate independent living and life skills in the youth transitioning into adulthood. We serve youth who have aged out of the foster care system and are OKSA eligible. Clients and members of the community can receive support through our counseling services. Services include mental health assessments, individual, family, and group therapy, and after-hour crisis services. We believe that our programs and counseling services work together to reunify families through intervention, prevention, and restoration. We are ready to spend the next 100 years exemplifying the compassion of Christ through help, healing, and hope. Will you join us? Circle of Care is one of the ministries that Centenary United Methodist Church supports um, through our annual conference giving. So part of all of your offerings that you give to the church, go to several ministries around the state and Circle of Care is one of them. So thank you for your generous support. It's not just doing good here in Lawton, but all around the state and all around the world through our other ministries. You can give your offerings in the basket here uh, next to the door as you leave, or you can come by during the church, or come by to the church during the week, and you can also give online at lawtoncentenary.org. Will you join me as we bless these offerings? Gracious God, we give you thanks for the many gifts that you pour out upon us. We turn some of those back to you now. May they be used for the building of your kingdom in this place and around the world. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Jesus Christ. 
Let us pray. Oh God, long ago, one of your disciples poured out a costly, smelly jar of perfume and the fragrance filled the room as she anointed your son, Jesus. May our prayers and our worship of you this day be a sweet-smelling fragrance to you. 
May our actions as we go out from this place, inspired by your love, be a sweet-smelling fragrance in the world around us. We pray for all those who are broken and hurting, maybe even ourselves. We ask for the healing ointment of your love and your grace and your healing to be poured out upon us and upon those who are hurting the most. That wherever there is pain, you would bring comfort. Wherever there is fear, you would bring peace. Wherever there is loneliness, you would bring companionship. And God, however we might be that healing balm in the world, use us to be your hands and feet. And oh God, as we move through this broken world, we are troubled by the hate and the violence that we see around us. We lift up to you all victims of hate, especially the women who were shot and killed in Georgia this last week. We pray for their families, for their communities, torn apart in grief and in fear. We ask for your love to overwhelm all of the hate in the world, that your followers would stand up against hate and injustice and proclaim your good news. God, we pray for the people in our lives the ones that we love who are dealing with illness or injury. We ask for healing. And we pray for those who are caring for them and ask for strength. And in all things, God, we ask for your will to be done. We pray all of these things in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Our scripture today comes from Mark 14, 3 through 9. While he was at Bethany, in the house of Simon the leper, as he sat at the table, a woman came with an alabaster jar, a very costly ointment of nard. And she broke open the jar and poured the ointment on his head. But some were there who said to one another in anger, Why was this ointment wasted in this way? For this ointment could have been sold for more than 300 denarii, and the money given to the poor. And they scolded her. But Jesus said, Let her alone. Why do you trouble her? She has performed a good service for me. For you always have the poor with you, and you can show kindness to them whenever you wish. But you will not always have me. She has done what she could. She has anointed my body beforehand for its burial. Truly I tell you, wherever the good news is proclaimed in the whole world, what she has done will be told in remembrance of her. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Spirit of the living God, fall afresh on us. Spirit of the living God, fall afresh on us. Melt us, mold us, fill us, use us. Spirit of the living God, fall afresh on us. Amen. When I was young, my aunt and uncle took a trip to Paris. And while they were gone, their daughter, my cousin, came to stay with us. And she was about my and my sister's age, so we had a great time hanging out together and playing. We didn't get to see each other that often because they lived far away. So we just really enjoyed that time together. And I'm also sure that my aunt and uncle enjoyed their time away and some time to be together with themselves because when they came back, they brought with them from France a nice bottle of wine, and they gave it to my mom to thank us for watching their daughter. Now my mom took that nice bottle of French wine and did with it what you would expect a person to do. She stowed it away in the cabinet, saving it for a special occasion. And she saved it long enough that we eventually we moved. And when we moved, the wine got packed in a box and it got taken across town to our new house, and then it got put in another cabinet there, safe and sound, waiting for a special day. Because right? when you have something special, like a nice bottle of wine, you're not going to break it out on a random Tuesday. 
You're looking for the right moment to savor it. A special occasion. Maybe a visit from family. Maybe a birthday or an anniversary. Maybe the end of the world. Who knows how long you're going to hold on to this special something and break it out at the right time. Now every once in a while you might be digging around in the cabinet or see the, the bottle up on the shelf and think, hmm, today's the day. I'm going to enjoy this nice luxury. And you pick up the bottle and you hold it in your hands and you think about how long you've been waiting to enjoy it and how good it's going to be and how important it is to you. And the bottle starts to glow in your hand as you can just see the value and the luxury radiating off of it. And you think, today, today's not special enough for this. We'll put it back on the shelf. Because once we use that consumable, it is consumed, it is gone. The value lies in its ability to be used later. When you have a nice bottle of French wine on the shelf, you have something nice. But after you drink it, you have an empty bottle. And where's the value in that? Now, all of the special item's value is in its ability to be used later. Now, this woman and Mark had a special item of her own. This bottle of costly perfume, this ointment made of nard. This wasn't something that you used a little bit of whenever you felt like it. This was a special occasion bottle. We're told it cost 300 denarii. Denarii was about what an average worker would make in a day. So 300 days of work stored up in this bottle. Who knows, maybe it was a gift from her brother when he went traveling and he brought it back with him. Or maybe it was a gift from a dear friend. Or maybe the woman had saved up over a long time to be able to buy this little item of luxury. This was not an everyday item. And like all consumables, the perfume's value was in its ability to be used. Because once you used it up and the smell faded away, it lost all of its worth. It was gone. Vanished. The value meant nothing anymore. And you're left with just a sticky, empty bottle. But one day, she had a special guest over. And after the dinner was over, she got up, walked over to the cabinet. Maybe she dug around for a little bit, or it was up on a shelf where everyone could see it. And she took down the bottle of perfume, and she broke off the lid and poured out the whole contents of it onto the head of Jesus. And immediately, all of the value was gone. She had used it up. That bottle on the shelf went from being 300 denarii to nothing. It's being a broken, empty jar. A complete collapse in value, a huge hit to her and her family's net worth. And the disciples that were around Jesus, maybe it was the 12 or maybe it was other followers of Jesus, they start to criticize the woman. What have you done? You've wasted this beautiful thing. You could have sold this and given the proceeds to the poor. Now before you start to think that the disciples were the kind of crowd that was ready to eat the rich and get rid of all luxury... Think about and ask yourself, what would the disciples have done if that bottle of perfume had just stayed on the shelf all night? Would they have even noticed it? Do you think after dinner, Peter would have looked up and saw that bottle of perfume and said, hmm, what are you doing with something nice like that? What good is it doing on the shelf there? 
Now, I have a hunch, and I, I can't prove it, but I think if they just finished dinner and went on their way, even if all of the disciples saw this expensive bottle of perfume on the shelf, none of them would have batted an eye or worried about it. Because as long as it stood up on the shelf, it had that poor person helping potential. It could be used at any time down the road. But once she emptied it, it lost that value, that potential. All of that value is now dripping down Jesus' beard onto the floor. 300 denarii. Poof. It's pretty easy to put a value on things, on stuff, items that can be bought and sold, because we value something for how much you can sell it or buy it for. If you think that a cup of coffee is worth five bucks, you will spend five bucks on it. If you're more interested in 50 cent coffee, you will go and find 50 cent coffee. If there isn't an agreed upon price, you can haggle with the seller or we have auctions. We have all kinds of different markets to set the value of things. But it's harder to talk about the value of a life. We've had times in our history when people were bought and sold as slaves, but their value wasn't in their personhood. It was in their value as a thing, as an item, as labor. And that was obviously a wrong and terrible valuation of human life. Life isn't that simple to value. We have actuaries and lawyers and ethicists who debate how much life is worth. That way we can pay out life insurance claims or settle wrongful death claims and have pain and suffering compensation. But all of those things start to feel icky when they get personal. How much would you pay to keep your child alive? What would you give for your parents' life? What would you want in return if something happened to them? If your house was on fire, would you run back into the flames for your nice bottle of French wine? Would you run back into the flames to save your child? 300 denarii starts to look really small when we get into these kinds of conversations about valuing life itself. A whole year's salary looks small when compared to the value of life. Over the summer, I was concerned when I seemed to see more coverage on the news and hear more outrage about destruction that was caused by riots than I seemed to hear about the destruction of human life that had sparked the riots. Now, obviously, there was, there was outrage about both, right? Upset outrage about senseless loss of life. But there's also outrage about destruction of property. And at times, it felt off. Like we were having two different conversations, trying to value stuff and humans on a scale together. Burning buildings and broken glass make for really good and interesting TV, but the windows are repaired. In most places, businesses are reopened. Property insurance can replace stuff. Life insurance doesn't replace life. In my mind, and I think in God's mind, life is always going to be more valuable than stuff. Yet here are the followers of Jesus yelling at this woman for destroying some property. For pouring perfume on the head of Jesus. 
But the way that this woman used this perfume, it shows us how much she valued Jesus himself. To her, Jesus was worth a lot more than 300 denarii. To this woman, Jesus was worth every last drop of that perfume. Jesus was a special enough reason to break out the good stuff and to use it up, to use it all, to not even take off the lid and use a drop, but to break off the lid and pour out everything. See, this story comes at a critical time in the Gospel of Mark. Because from here on out, Jesus is treated as a criminal whose life does not matter. Jesus even goes to this dinner as a dead man because just before we learn that the the scribes and the rulers have already decided that they are going to kill Jesus and they're just waiting for the right time. We're not far from the cross at all. Because when they get up from this meal, it's not long after that one of Jesus' disciples betrays him. One of his closest followers denies him. Jesus is put on trial before Pilate where he is mocked and then beaten to within an inch of his life. And he's taken out to the cross and he's stripped of all of his clothes and he's hung up on the cross. And at that point, as the soldiers are casting lots to see who will get his clothes, his clothes are worth more than his life. No one else, through the rest of this Gospel of Mark, puts any value on the life of Jesus. This woman and her act of anointing him, of pouring out this perfume on his head, is the only one who treats him as a human, as life that is worth something. Her act is an act of resistance. It reminds me in the book and the movie, The Hunger Games, which is, in this story, children and youth are forced into this combat to the death for the entertainment of people. And the main character, Katniss, is is in this arena battling other children in life or death combat. And one of the other competitors, a young girl named Rue, who she befriends, is killed. And now, normally, you would just, if the person standing next to you is killed in the battle, you would run away and hide and try to save yourself. And, not, and then a big spaceship from the sky comes in and scoops up the, the dead body like it's garbage. But Katniss stays behind picks hundreds of flowers and arranges them around Rue's body and prepares her for a proper burial. Even in death, Katniss recognized the value of Rue's life and treated her as a human. Or another example, it's like a soldier who runs back into the battlefield back into danger to retrieve the body of his fallen brother. So that he can have a proper burial. It's that kind of valuing of life in the midst of destruction when nothing else around there puts any value on that. When the rest of the system thought nothing of Jesus, thought him a criminal worthy only of death, This woman pours out everything she has to recognize his value. After all, what value would that perfume have if it just stayed up on the shelf? That bottle of wine stayed in the cabinet so long that by the time my mom finally dug it out and decided it was a good enough day to open it, it had spoiled. It was vinegar, in her own words. Because stuff depreciates. It loses its value. It's just stuff. Jesus is calling you. 
follow me and pour out everything that you have. Use what you have, even enjoy what you have, but do it in a way that recognizes the value of others, especially those who nobody else will recognize. Isn't that the whole point of giving to the poor anyways? Of recognizing that a person's life has value even if that person doesn't have enough money to sustain it. That is why we give and care and share what we have. Robert told me a story about a friend of his who was in prison. And if you flip over to the other channel right now, you might even hear Robert telling the same uh, story in his sermon. He didn't tell me I had to use this story. I heard him talking about it and thought, this is perfect. But his friend was in prison, and Robert went to visit him. And as they were visiting, Robert noticed that his friend had two pillows on his bed, and his cellmate had none. And Robert asked how he got the second pillow, and his friend said, well, my cellmate could tell that I couldn't sleep that I was uncomfortable, that I can't sleep with one pillow because of some, some injuries that I have. And so he gave me his only pillow so that I could have two and I could sleep well. And Robert asked him, why do you think he did that? And his friend said, he told me that he met Jesus and he wanted to be a Christian. Jesus poured out everything that he had on the cross for you and me. And then Jesus calls us to pour out what we have for others. Because to me, following Jesus and showing compassion and recognizing humanity is more valuable than even a pillow in prison or a bottle of wine in a cabinet, or a jar of perfume on the shelf. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. God gives to us all kinds of gifts. But sometimes we either hold on to them out of fear, fear that we won't have enough when we give, or fear that our gifts won't be good enough. So during the season of Lent, as we reflect, we reflect on the times that we don't use what God has given us for God's kingdom. And one of the gifts of the season of Lent is, is confession, where we get to give that to God, give our mistakes to God and then receive God's forgiveness poured out upon us. Will you join me now in our prayer of confession? O oh Lord, our sovereign, you blessed us with spiritual gifts, yet we hide our gifts because we fear that we won't be good enough. Teach us to trust your abundant grace. Amen. Hear this good news. In the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. I invite you as we sing this last song to think about what gifts you have in your life and how God is calling you to use them, to take them down off the shelf and to pour them out. And if you're ready to, to pour yourself out to God, um, either through baptism or remembering your baptism or reaffirmation of faith, or if there's another ministry that we can do, anything that we can be praying for you today, I invite you to come forward and, and meet me over here on the side of the stage as we're singing. Or if you're joining us online, send us a comment or a message, or please call us at the church. Let us continue our worship together.
your mercy never fails me all my days i've been held in your hands from the moment that i wake up until i lay my head oh i will sing of the goodness of
God has poured out God's love for you through the gift of Jesus Christ that we might go into the world and pour ourselves out for others. Wherever you go this week, whatever you do, may you be the gift of God's grace in somebody else's life. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, go in peace. Amen. There's power that can empty out a grave. There's resurrection power that can save. There's power in your name.